Our morning offering is of our whole being to God for His glory which precedes any effective learning as we continue our lifelong path becoming Catholic. In this section of our study we consider how to incorporate salvation. Incorporate is an ideal word. We are body, corpus, and to be saved this body must bring the life of the spirit into itself, the reality of salvation purchased for us by the death and resurrection of God's Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We incorporate salvation by our participation in the church. We enter the church through baptism and our faith in Jesus, or through baptism and our parents' faith in Jesus. But we appropriate or incorporate this faith with confirmation and make it our own by participation in the body and blood of Jesus. He in us and we in him and obedience to the church. Let's look again at the enhanced diagram we've used so often of union with God that we constructed with the resurrection using faces for numbers on the bottom line of that familiar diagram. There we see man and woman in the Holy Spirit establishing what God intended to be a sign on earth of himself, a family a fruitful man and woman, a loving, fruitful unit who in cooperation with God brings other souls into the world. That is an image of the Holy Trinity. We need to underline that single people, male and female, in union with Jesus in themselves are also a sign of this image. In this image, God intends to share and to spread his own joy and creativity. Man and woman, in all their individual units throughout the whole world, would then form a huge family of humanity whom God wills to unite to himself in a loving, creative union, a loving unit with a unity reflecting the Holy Spirit the Holy Trinity, bound together by the person of the Trinity, who is the person of union and love, the Holy Spirit of God, love. If you understand this, you understand the Catholic Church and its claim to be the earthly unified family God intended from the beginning. Because it is made up of people who still struggle with sin, who have not fully made up their minds or fully set their wills to live the gift of the Holy Spirit, we see the church still as imperfect. However, with an image of the perfect always projected upon it. This is because at any one time, The church is speaking the word of God with Jesus alive in the sacraments. And there are thousands upon thousands who have incorporated incorporated their salvation and who are living a whole and holy life. The purpose of God in establishing salvation history in this fallen world is to form again what was lost in Eden, a people, a community, a family, he can bring into union with himself. With Abraham's family, God began to form a people who would respond to him. Using the cultural and intellectual gifts of this family to lay a foundation that would prepare for the gigantic, magnificent thing he would do in the fullness of time. I love this icon of Jesus. It speaks of his power and authority and love 
and love. He, the Son of God, is the true head of the church. Looking closely, it is apparent that his eyes are looking in different directions. One eye looks directly at the viewer. The other looks at God. And so he is the man God, the one interceder between God and man. See Romans 8.34 I have used this icon over the years and I've recently found information that surprised me. This is not an ancient icon, I assumed it to be, but a modern one memorializing a Russian event, a perhaps of modern martyrs, at least. It's not what I had thought, but it suits so well the thought I attached to it that I will continue to use it. If you look hard, you'll see these elements. First, we see Jesus, the head of the church, with his mother at his right hand, surrounded by what I thought were the apostles. One seems to be Peter with the keys. One seems to be a youth. And uh, to account for 13, I was wondering if St. Paul was considered one of the apostles. But now, of course, I realize these are meant to be martyrs. On the next level are bishops and priests surrounding an Eucharistic altar. Then below, mid-center, a church building like church, churches recognizable to those in past times and it's blessed by its angel as it's spoken of in Revelation 2. Holy priests, perhaps popes, are confecting the Eucharist in persona Christi at the foot of the cross, which represents the heavenly banquet, and some of the thousands of holy persons who are united in the body of Christ surrounding the banquet. Below are the thousands of the faithful, for all the central point is that holy sacrifice of the Mass in heaven and on earth, just as the book of Revelation pictures it. When someone comes to you to tell you that the church is not a church building, we know that much better than they do and have for 2,000 years. Clearly, the painter of this icon was presenting a family, not merely saved individuals, but a family. The family is both in heaven and on earth. Like a family, its members depend on each other and pray for each other. As Hebrews 11:39 says, apart from us, they should not be made perfect. And we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. You recall that from the beginning God promised a place, a people, an appointed leader. Abraham, the leader, was given a place, a land, and a promise that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars, and a people that would be as his sons. The people grew to be a nation with Moses, a leader appointed by God. The place became the promise of a land flowing with milk and honey, the very land promised to Abraham 700 years earlier. The people were those rescued from slavery in Egypt and made a nation. Throughout their long history, they were promised someone was coming a leader who would be king forever and form an everlasting kingdom, a place peopled by his family. In the meantime, Israel was the name given the people, and Jerusalem became the heart of Israel, the place that symbolized the whole place given to them in the land of Ju Israel, Judah. This is Isaiah 62 and chapter 66. 10 through 19. 
God kept his promise throughout their troubled history, and though they renewed the covenant with blood over and over again, they were unable to keep their part of it. The second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, was sent to take all sins upon himself to pay the price. He rose from the dead, making a way for all those who live in him to defeat death and Satan. Now a people are able to receive the Holy Spirit. A family is formed again and is on the way to becoming whole and holy. So what is the place for them? A place is formed from the side of Christ on the cross. The Church of Baptism and Eucharist. This completes the salvation offered by God and fulfills the need of human nature for family as well as for a place for that family to come together around the sacraments. Israel was formed as a nation, a family from twelve tribes. The unity of its covenant was symbolized by Jerusalem and the temple in Jerusalem, long gone after being destroyed in 70 A.D. Jesus and the Holy Spirit form a people who are a new family bonded by the new covenant in the blood of Jesus, the new Israel. The place for them is the new Jerusalem or the Catholic Church and its symbol of unity is St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. This is the symbolic hub of all the hundreds of thousands of Catholic churches around the world which are located in 2,300 dioceses and archdioceses under about 2,500 bishops. Wherever the tabernacle is with Jesus, body, blood, soul and divinity there is the one place of the people of God the extended temple of his body which will exist until Jesus comes again then he will be our tabernacle and our temple as in Revelation 21 the Catholic Church around the world is one people under one head Jesus and his appointed steward, the Holy Father, and one place, the extended New Jerusalem, wherever the tabernacle of Jesus Christ is. The underpinnings of the Great Basilica of St. Peter in Rome have been archaeologically examined by excavation, and the tomb of St. Peter has been discovered. How perfect is God's plan. The hub of Christendom rests on the bones of the first pope, Peter the Rock. This Peter, not allowing that his crucifixion should imitate his lords, requested that he be hung head down. Here are two electrifying paintings, one by Caravaggio and the other by Michelangelo. He was crucified on Vatican Hill in Rome in 64 or 65 A.D. From the earliest days of the persecuted church, this tomb was revered, and churches were built upon it until the present huge church was built in the 16th century with a dome construction, constructed on the plans of Michelangelo. Peter is truly the rock upon whom Jesus' church is built even in its historical foundation. This promise carries forever. It goes all the way through the Bible and after Jesus establishes his church what do we have? We have a people, actually a family. We have a place, not a land, but a church that meets together every hour of every week in what is an extended place, yet only one place around the world 
especially in that extended place, each Sunday. We have a leader, a father, always necessarily male, the successor of Peter, the Holy Father of the people of God, with extensions of himself in bishops and priests around the world. When I narrated this, our Holy Father, Benedict XVI, had resigned and we are awaiting a replacement Holy Father. How can Jesus' last prayer be fulfilled? That they may be one Father as we are one. How are Jesus and his Father one? By the submission of his will to his Father's will, they have one will. To stay united and not be swept by personal interpretations and charismatic revelations or inspirations, maybe of the evil one who quotes scripture for his own purposes, we must submit our wills to divinely instituted authority. Wherever there is divisiveness, regardless of the words given to describe it, it is not the Holy Spirit. Splits in the churches are always described as moves of the Spirit toward truth. The Spirit has promised to guide us into all truth, but those opposed to the Church of Christ say it went astray from the truth. Is that possible? Can the Holy Spirit fail in guiding the Church Jesus founded? Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. We must not be led astray by false prophets. If even an angel brings another gospel, do not believe it. That's a quote from Galatians 1.8. Nowhere in the Bible are the words that other churches rely on, faith alone or scripture alone, to be found. Contrary to this, the Bible demands faith and works of faith. The Sermon on the Mount and James and truth resting on past on tradition and the pillar of the one church demand unity. First Timothy three fifteen and second Thessalonians two fifteen. I suggest that you copy this chart and the next so that you can eventually copy them out on your printer. On this first chart, a straight line comes down from Jesus Christ and it points out several truths. First, the history of the Catholic Church starts with Jesus and continues straight through to today. Second, the Catholic Church's teaching on the Eucharist, being truly the body and blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, goes straight back to the last supper. Three, the Catholic Church praying for the dead and consequently the existence of pur purgatory goes straight back to what Christians believed in the early centuries of the church and what the Ch Jews also did before Christ. Four, the Catholic Church's practice of honoring Mary goes back to the time of Jesus Christ. Jesus obeyed all the commandments. He honored his mother, and the church continues to do so. Fifth, the bishop of Rome has authority over all other bishops of the world. Six, as churches broke away from the Catholic Church, they changed the teaching, some in a few ways, others in many ways. And this is the second chart that I have suggested that you save and run off. This chart begins with the Reformation, unlike the previous chart, which began with Jesus. All of these denominations, what to make of it? We must leave them in the hands of the Lord. Those who love Jesus will have salvation. But that does not mean that they are in the church that he founded, or that they fully understand his heart's desire for his church. 
It is impossible that he, fervently desiring the unity of his followers, as he expressed so beautifully in John 17, that he would have left them without a divinely instituted form of government? No, that cannot be. As Catholics, we are to open our hearts to our separated brothers and sisters and to pray for the unity of all Christians. However, ecumenism does not mean that all churches are the same or that all churches are complete. Only one church holds the fullness of God's church. The church is always conscious of the need of its reform from time to time. Abuses creep in. There have been abuses since Vatican II, which attempted to bring the church into the modern world, but these are mere blemishes which are eventually corrected or removed, and they do not permanently harm the beauty, goodness, truth, and unity of the church Jesus founded and the church that the Holy Spirit leads. The respect that God gives the free will of persons is the cause for all the disarray and the fact that, continu that Satan and continues to contend against the church even though his end is accomplished on the cross and is in the progress of com being complete. While well, we must pause and consider the Catholic Church as she faces the moral I issues of our day, she cannot hold herself up as a paragon of virtue, anything but. She fails miserably and in the sight of all. Because of who she is and what she claims, she's held to a higher standard than any other organization. Her sins will be made public over and over again, while other organizations, many times more guilty, will be spared. This is just. Nevertheless, she never can or will back away from the proclamation of truth. God has invested salvation of the whole world with her. She can never betray that trust, and she has been assured by Jesus that he will not allow the gates of hell to conquer her. If the Catholic Church could deny the truth ever, civilization would collapse. There are many who claim there is no such thing as truth. If that were so, life would be meaningless and all human efforts blind and futile. If you are still with this study, you've been very patient, and especially when I'm bringing your attention again the diagram that began our journey, the diagram in which absorbed deeply answers many of these questions. The first person is the male, first only in divine order because he's initiator imprinted in his physical body. The second person, the woman, is the responder or receiver, her body made by God for her role. The first person is made to express the first person initiator, the father, and the second person is created to image the second person of the Trinity, God the Son, Yet the feminine prototype in the Trinity is God the Son. Yes, he comes to save us as male because all persons of the Trinity are necessarily initiators to us humans who are able only to receive. The scriptures make this clear by naming all God persons, husband, father, and bridegroom, and in every pairing, all humankind, male and female, feminine, bride, or wife, we are all feminine to God, as John Paul II taught. Absorb this, please, absorb it. It is key to understanding what is going on in our culture. 
the evil one who broke into and broke down perfection of the original creation, the devil, Satan, overturned creation by implanting envy of the first person by the second. First, by teaching Adam and Eve that they could be gods themselves, this is based on this nearly indelible lie. First means best. Second means nearly worthless. Liar. Liar. First and second are mere matter of order. They are not matters of value. Father and Son are equals. Man and woman in creation are equals. Their roles do not assume that one is better than the other. Liar, liar. This lie weights down everything on fallen earth. Envy of authority and its misuse is the devil's mark on the world. Under holy authority, the man is strong and the woman and her children are protected and cared for. Refusing headship weakens a man and distorts a woman. He in his role is never to be domineering. Authority, headship, is exercised as a godly responsibility. You watch these movies and these television productions. It, they depict women as the fiercest, most masculine creature imaginable. Every depiction of woman generally has her with a gun, a sword, or some other brutal means of ass uh, asserting her own will. Do you see how envy of males has malformed the woman? If the second person is being taught by Satan to envy the first, and in fact to subdue the first, it's the root of all evil and we are inundated with this wipe out of truth on every side. No one blinks at it. Should women be firefighters and soldiers just because they can overcome their feminine nature to do it? Should men's sports be the goal of the athletic woman? even though it causes her feminine capability of childbearing to cease, even though it brings on osteoporosis at an early age? What is the fem female body telling us? Has God written his directions of women in her body? I cannot emphasize this enough if I stood on a housetop and screamed. I would be considered a nut. I re uh, reuse these little pictures. You've seen this before. The church knows at bedrock the polarity of man and woman means something. The teachers, however, rarely explain it to anyone's satisfaction. Males exercise headship. Is this an honor? I wouldn't think so. When it's carried out in obedience to God's command, it demands self-giving. That to be a servant of all, a submissive one, is to be like him. All humankind is second person to the Trinity. The woman has a second role in both her relationship to her husband and her relationship as a person in the church to the Holy Trinity. The man has two roles. He is submissive to those in authority over him in the church, actually, actually in government. And he is head over his wife and the family in his home. Dear God, help your children to get this right. When the truth of sexual meaning is absorbed, Many questions in our day of moral issues are clear. The sanctity of marriage is based on the relationship ordained by God, faithful and fruitful. 
Many persons may never marry or have a sexual relationship with another for many reasons and they will still be whole and holy before God. Those who do not marry reach out for the grace to live chastely in celibacy. Masturbation is not an allowable exercise of sexuality for it obviously has no other outcome than licentiousness. This mental habit deteriorates a person's most essential interior growth in holiness. That is true human wholeness of mind and spirit. And does not all the preceding explain why the church cannot and will not bless the marriage of two of the same sex? The very terminology is impossible. Marriage is for the procreation of children, the establishment of the family, its protection and provision. Marriage is an image of the relationship of first and second persons of the Trinity, ob-positioned persons who cannot take each other's place. Two of the same place, two first persons, two second persons, simply cannot be married. Look again at the diagram a grave disorder. It destroys the very meaning of marriage. It becomes, If it becomes common in society, it will destroy civilization. There may be no divorce. The Holy Spirit, the unity between the two, is ready to bring healing, repentance, forgiveness, and growth and holiness to the two in marriage. Because of the readiness of the Spirit to be their unity, if a marriage fails and a divorce is sought, for the persons to remarry, the Church must find assurance that the Holy Spirit was never the third person in this union. Some other commitment took its place, took his place. Any number of things, alcohol or drugs, denial of children, a prior, prior commitment to another person, a love of money more than spouse, or co co a coercion, coercion on either party. If such is found, a true marriage never took place. Annulment will declare it, and a person may find a spouse to unite with him or herself for a true, indissolvable permanent marriage. It should be very clear then that any refusal to allow the exercise of sexuality to result in fruitfulness is a negation of the very meaning of the two bodies. Contraception and sterilization are serious sins. We discussed natural family planning on an earlier lesson and we still strongly urge couples who want to obey the church to find teachers and learn the truth of this. Every person should read Pope Paul VI encyclical Humanae Vitae. It was simply prophetic at bedrock and continues to explain what is happening to our culture. In summation, certainly at this point, I do not need to defend male priesthood. Look again at the central diagram. Isn't the answer there? Men are given headship from the beginning. St. Paul recognized the threat to the church when women, misunderstanding freedom in Christ, began to assert themselves in his congregation. He's emphatic, and though he doesn't explain it very well in 1 Corinthians 11, he knows that it's an expression of disorder in the church and it can't be allowed. This is not misogynism. It is godly order established from the beginning. It must be evident at this point that the body with all its intense feeling and meaning can be badly misused when God's law is ignored. God's law, as it's written in the Ten Commandments and in the laws of the church, any 
use of the body, any lascivious longings or desires, is sinful. The body is made for beauty and holiness. The statistics of the prevalence of pornography among Christian Catholic men and women is alarming. It is a proven destroyer of personality and certainly of good relationships. My monks, echoing Jesus, would say it is demonic power. Get to a priest. Get to confession and continue to go there to be free from this demon. Provocative dress has become so common, it's just an emblem of woman. She has become an ever-present model of pornography in her very bearing. The way she dresses is patterned after the dress of prostitutes, and she has become proud of that. This attitude can only have been imbibed by the deceiver. How can it be overturned and returned to real beauty of dress well, that's in the hands of young women and their mothers who, for expressing true goodness and beauty, begin to design for themselves fashions that speak of the things men really want, a chaste, innocent, and lovely woman. The country is at this moment embroiled in a bitter controversy of the intrusions of the state and the prerogatives of the church. I cannot begin to outline the dangers of this intrusion here, but every Christian should make himself aware of the stakes. They are high and the threat to the church is real. Become informed. 